So um, even though you you heard a little bit of history yesterday, right? There was a lecture about history. I wanted to kind of create a timeline to tell you how far we have come. So the first one was in 1822. Um, it was a German Persian um, surgeon who tried to transplant hair from his head to his arm. And hair grew, and that was the, the very beginning of hair transplantation. The next one down the line is the Japanese surgeon who tried to transplant pubic hair. And this is really fascinating. In Japan, they use public bath, and it would be shameful not to have a pubic hair. So that was more important for them, and that's how the first transplantation started, by moving hair into the pubic area, um, which also showed that the hair was surviving there. Then the next physician was also in Japan, Tamura. What he did, he now started taking a, a clump of hair and cutting it into pieces and putting it in a different part of the skull, which would be in 1943, this was before the war, and it survived and, and really grew, but then we didn't hear anything about until the war was finished and taken by American physician who started following the, the principle of hair transplantation developing Japan and started developing hair transplantation. So the more he worked with, the more he realized that there is a certain characteristics to hair transplantation, which means it's called a donor dominance. If you have if we take hair from the back and move it into different areas of, he of the head, they will not fall out because they keep the characteristics of where they came from. I'm from Serbia. No matter where you move me, I'll still be from Serbia. So I keep certain characteristics from where I came from. The hair on the top is usually programmed to fall out. It's susceptible to fall out because of some receptors within the hair that they're um, create, make hair sensitive and at one point lazy and, and hair falls out. But the, the donor dominance is what we use today as a principle for hair transplantation. A little digression to this, um, in the last 10, 15 years, we are also, probably 10 years, we started doing body hair transfer. So you can transplant hair, and they say within a five to eight years, hair start growing a little bit longer. So on a body, hair usually grows short, and then the hair starts growing longer and taking now recipient dominance characteristics. So it's interesting, human body is constantly um, amazing us with new and new discoveries. So the next movement between 60s and 80s happened where um, we are starting to develop, the first description of follicular units was done, then we, we started thinking if we don't have enough hair, maybe we can uh, shrink. By the way, it's getting hot here. Are you hot or just on this side? Uh, hot or no? No, okay. So it must be this side, something is hot here. Heat is on my side, I'm producing heat. Skull production. So um, there was theories where if you cut piece of this tissue, and they want you to just know what is out there, so that you are well educated about the industries, not just cutting grafts and putting them back in. So what it did, they would cut the piece of tissue, suture together, which means the ball spot from being this big, it became smaller. But cutting it more and more, what happened? Then they would end up with scar in the middle and distorted, so the hair is pointing this way. The more you move it up, the more it kind of creates this play in the middle. It didn't look natural. The other thing, the head is curved. The more you stretch it, now you end up with this bunched hair in the middle, and it didn't look natural. Then they developed something that was like a Mercedes sign. So there's a the evolution in skull production, but the drawback to skull production is the skin would stretch back. So whatever they gain with skull production, they would remove the empty tissue, and then the tissue would relax, and they would be at the square one. So they didn't really gain a lot. Um, skull production was more immediate result. It was most fascinating. So if you look at the result here, this was immediately, this is as soon as the sutures are removed. But see how much gain this person got in one hour procedure. It was more advanced, it was bigger kind of surgery, although it was done in office like a hair transplantation. Um, these days, rarely, rarely anybody doing is doing hair skull production. However, there's a physician in France, now in Switzerland, who is still doing hair transplantation in, with skull production. So he has these amazing results, but he's the only one. Um, then another procedure that happened was a flap. 
So what they thought, oh, what if we take a piece of the tissue from here and just rotate it up front? So it creates this thick hairline. And, and so there would be a scar on the side hidden and this thick hairline and they just grow and comb longer. However, there was downside, there were two different flaps, Yuri flap and Elliot flap. So they were taken from two sides and then what happens with the flap is the blood supply, if this is the hair from the back and rotated to the front, the blood supply is here, sometimes it doesn't come to the end. So the end will die out, so they would end up with thick hair on one side and not hair, enough hair. So the, the flaps that survived and looked good ended up with something like this. They would have thick hair in the front and nothing in the back because they continue to lose hair, right? So it was good they can comb it back, but if it's windy, everything is just there like this thick. So these days we can repair that. What is done is you can thin out, you can punch out hairs out of the flap, so you make your flap thin, small hairs is placed behind, more hairs transplanted, so it is fixable. But you need to know that this was at one point a procedure that was performed. Um, and to this day, just recently, we repaired one of the Elliot's fla Elliot flaps. So they're still around, and so you need to know that that existed too. Then we move forward, and then um, in 1996, the, it was an introduction of um, microscopes. So first we discover follicular units, right? And so these are the groupings we're talking about for the first time. We, uh, we thought for here just grew and the world just hairs, right? And then looking more, examining, it's like, oh, this is two hairs, two hairs, two, three hairs. And so, oh, there's a groupings. And then that is where they discover that there's a unit that comes with a sebaceous gland and how grafts survive better and we can recreate more natural look if we respect what grows naturally, which is in follicular units. Then we have microscopes. Now, so 1996, we're 2004, almost, uh, 2014, I'm sorry, almost, we have to now everybody switch to microscopes. So um, life progresses, everybody is using cell phones, um, watching color TV, now it's time to start using microscope. Like it's getting more and more accepted that there is, it's a standard of uh, care. And then we have in, in 2004, um, so the hair transplantation is evolving, evolving, and there's a new jump. Uh, follicular unit extraction. So what happens at the beginning of hair transplantation, they would take a punch and they would punch out hair from the back, then punch out the skull from the front and a plug from the, take the hair from the back and plug in the front. At the beginning there were big plugs. So when the hair was punched out from the back, the side, site needed to be sutured. They were talking about four millimeter punches. So the donor hair will look all scarred. Um, and then the plugs were placed straight in. So this is why it looked like a doll hair because there were clumps of 20 some hairs. Then they realized this is way too unnatural. So they started cutting. So we started, when I started with the big plugs, we cut them in uh, half and quarters. So you put a quarter in the front and a half in the back and a full plug a little further back. And we were doing 80 grafts, and I started 23 years ago. So 80 grafts, like it was a big case, right? Like, ooh. And then we jumped to 150, like, whoa, right? So it is interesting how much everything progressed. But what was interesting about plugs, so they started doing, they start plugging things out from the back, and the first time they were inserting them straight in. Then they started noticing the baby, they needed to angle them. Then the, the scar that was left behind, they thought, maybe if we come, if we tuck, cut out the ellipse, then we just plug everything out of the lips. They thought, why would we do that? Then the ellipse evolved into no plugging, just taking the ellipse and starting cutting. So the, the evolution happened in a donor area and transplanted area and all along also, and I just realized I never incorporated medication. We started noticing that we can also use medication to slow down the progression of hair loss. But here is just about hair restoration. So in, in 2004, the old technique of plugs is now refined and now we are taking a small, small instrument doing exactly the same thing. We punch out follicular unit and, and 
transplanted in the front. So the idea of, in, in the 50s, we did big plugs. Now in the 2004, we're doing tiny, tiny follicular units, and it's called follicular unit extraction. So I would say still 70% of physicians do only strip harvesting, probably 30% do mixed, and maybe I would say 10, 15% just do follicular unit extraction. But it's gaining more and more popularity. The advantages of follicular unit extraction would be that the scars left behind are interspersed in the hair and easier to camouflage. So I'm going to advance in, so if you look at this gentleman had a strip surgery which left a linear scar. So we take the ellipse out, suture everything, and it leaves a linear scar hidden in the hair. If the shave head or cut it short, it's visible. So um, now the, these are used with a small instrument, just a follicle, like as if each graft is plucked out of the hair with scalp. And it leaves a tiny scars inside and it's much easier to camouflage them. However, it's not the scarless procedure, just the improvement in how something is done. Um, then the next process was to develop a better suturing. So in Australia and France, um, two physicians, and I gave you the name so you kind of, in the picture, so you get a little bit kind of familiar. Hopefully you'll get to uh, more and more meetings and you're going to see more and more people at least hear about them. Um, they describe a technique, it's called a trichophytic closure. What happens is if you take a strip, so let's say this is my tissue from the back. We take this tissue out and suture these two sides together and leaves a tiny scar inside, right? So what happens is now the gap in between these, so I'm going to, the gap in between these is going to be filled with a scar. The trichophytic closure does something where this side is trimmed and then the sides are slightly overlapped. So when the scar is forming, hair grows through the scar, so it becomes more invisible. So this example here shows where the scar is not visible because the, the hair is overlapped and, and grew through the scar. However, even with the best surgeon, best technique, human body is unpredictable. We not, cannot guarantee that there, even trichophytic closure is going to create a closure without scar. Um, but it is important to know what is out there and if they ask you questions. So at the very end of 2013, we end up with hair cloning. What hair cloning does is we take the stem cells from the um, hair, put it in a petri dish, and, and it grew hair. So they did the testing on our mice. So there's a little patch of hair, I found this cute picture that it was associated with hair cloning, where they are saying that they, they're still figuring out how to make hair grow as natural because it, it's, they, it grows in clumps. It's not refined yet. Every year we thought we're going to have breakthrough and this has been 15 years still waiting for a breakthrough. Um, another thing, platelet-rich plasma, we are now using patient's blood. We spin it and separate portion of blood that contains a growth factor and inject back into the scalp to promote um, hair growth in, in, in better healing. So I'm just giving you some terms so that you know what is happening in the industry. Um, Dr. Umar was the one that started the body hair transplantation. Go research him, fascinating results. Um, I am amazed because people who had burn scalp and have no donor hair, he was able to take hair from the body and restore and make them look normal. And, and I'm always passionate about what we can do to help people. Uh, then we also have uh, robotic surgery. This is new since 2011. A robot is um, now available that can go in and take hairs individually. Every, this is just a tool. Every procedure, no matter what kind of tool you use, you need to know quality grafts, whether they're how you're trimming in them under the microscope. So the robot just to dissect, you still have to extract and you still have to uh, clean them, you still have to place them. So the basic principle stays the, stay the same. I just want you to know within the evolution what happened. And, and the most important thing, the central portion of this slide is ISHRS, it's International Society for Hair Restoration Surgeons. It is the um, organization that was uh, for, founded in 1993 with a mission to promote 
hair restoration industry. So it's a great uh, organization. They have yearly meetings. We have meetings there. So um, when we, you become a member, you get um, uh, uh, their form, which is a um, quarterly uh, journal. Great stuff to read, learn. Um, I love what I do and I and like um, sharing the passion and this organization is really very friendly in, in always promoting growth in, in expansion, very supportive. So that's all I have today for the um, re, uh, history of hair restoration. Any questions?